our law firm unapologetically stands up for the rights of the accused. All right. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Military Justice Today. I've got with me Robert Capavilla and Mickey Williams of Capavilla and Williams. So we got some uh, initial feedback about our pre-topic banter, and most people liked it. So why don't we spend a minute before we jump into today's topic? I'll give you guys some choices as to what we can talk about. How about the football rankings? The current NCAA football rankings would be a potential topic. I don't know if Capavilla wants to do that or not, but my um, team's ranked 10th. Oh my God. We're we, watching the demise of Ohio State. Ugh. Matt, cross examination. You were born in what state exactly? Let me give you the other topics. Your Honor, <laughs> please direct the witness to answer the question. <laughs> what state were you born in, Matt? Could you imagine that both Michigan schools are 4-0 and and Ohio State has a big Ladies L? and gentlemen, do you remember during cross-examination <laughs> when Matt think refused to answer the questions? Why do you think that is? But, you know, Clemson has two losses and they're still in the top 25. He, Ohio State could have three did losses. Did he not they... want you to know that he is from the state of Michigan where Ohio State is... All right, so our, years, our second option, one? our second option would be your advice to uh, law school students who are thinking about going into the JAG Corps. That's a good topic. Yeah, I like that one too. And then the third would be your last meal if you were on death row. What would oh, be your Lord. last meal? So we'll let Mickey pick the topic. What do you want to talk about, Mick? Uh, we only we're only going to spend a minute and thirty seconds. Yeah, on that's it. fine. I like the last meal thing. Actually, that's kind of quirky. Um, well, well, give us your give us your last one. So this is it for you. You're yeah. I think I would have a, a ribeye, uh, medium rare, definitely that. Uh, maybe a baked potato. You know, it's funny you bring this up because I actually read an article yesterday. Yeah, they about run. about um, uh, guys on death row and their last meals, and it was like it, it Fruit was, Loops. It was like crazy stuff yeah. that they would want, like a pint of ice cream. And I, I don't mean, think that's that crazy. Well, to me, it's just when you think your last meal, most people think like lobster or something, you know, something I would never eat probably of my last meal, but they, you think it's kind of fancy, Did maybe. You, didn't you just have lobster on, on Friday night we went out? Yeah, I'm just saying for your last meal, though. So yours is a ribeye rare. Yeah, medium rare. I mean. Mm-hmm. I, I, I like that. How about you, Rob? What would you have? Hmm. I'd have pizza. Yeah, I'd have that's pizza. a good one. I think I probably would, yeah, too, honestly. I'd have pizza. Where I All went to, right, so where give I went me the to college, whole... they had a barbecue chicken pizza that was outstanding. I would mm-hmm. eat that. Give me the whole course, though, because you get an appetizer, you get your main, and then you get a dessert. No, I would just have pizza. You just have pizza. That's it. <laughs> From where? Uh, so uh, a place called Padrone's, where I went to undergrad, I used to uh, – I gained a bunch of weight my sophomore year, and we went on diets um, the second half of the year, and I was on the Slim Fast diet, and I would cheat on Fridays – and my cheat meal, I'd eat like an entire large barbecue chicken pizza from this nice. small pizza place out there. And um, that's what I would eat for my last meal. Yeah. yeah. I, what I about like, desserts? So no dessert for you. What about, you are not? You guys aren't dessert guys. I don't like, I mean, I think Rob, you like dessert. I don't really care for it. I think you like the ice cream and the cookies and stuff. I, I, I do. I'm yeah. more of a, like a chips guy, chips and dip guy. You know. Nice. All right, so I'd go shrimp cocktail, but like the big meaty kind, kind of like they do at 120, but I've actually had some that are larger than those. Yeah. And then pizza would probably be near the top of the list, although like a good carbonara pasta would, I think, be up there as well, but probably pizza. And then bread pudding with a scoop of ice cream for dessert. Yeah. Oh, yeah. bread pudding's good. You've yeah. thought a lot about this. Well, yeah. Plus I'm, yeah. star- plus, I'm starving myself out right now. <laughs> yeah, so Matt right. has thought a lot about <laughs> yeah. his last meal. That's like ranger school. Uh, you get You make these lists. When you're in ranger school, about what you're going to eat when you when you get out, and you have this huge list of things that you that you or places you want to go, and uh, one of them was this guy was like, you need to go to Olive Garden and get uh, there was like some sort of like chocolate chip uh, pancake or something you could get, and I was thinking it was going to be this fantastic A chocolate chip pancake at Olive Garden. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was something like that, some kind of dessert. And I ordered it, and man, it was very underwhelming. But at, at the time, when you're in ranger school, you think it's like 
yeah. the best thing you could yeah. ever have. Somebody said you'd go to your last meal with like Olive Garden. I'd be skeptical about that. Just like, <laughs> oh my God, you got to try the seafood at Red that Lobster. Might be, that might be your last meal unplanned. <laughs> Red, <laughs> Red Lobster <laughs> has the best seafood in America. I'd be like, oh, I'm not sure. I yeah. All right. All, all right. So not, we're going to get in trouble with our audience if we do too much uh, pre-topic. So today's topic, very serious one, administra- administrative separation boards and hearings in the military. So this is a cool topic. I don't think the average person, certainly I didn't know anything about it before I started working with you guys, but uh, it's a fascinating topic. We're going to kind of dissect it. I know you guys have good points that you're going to make throughout, but uh, today you guys call it, you guys call it ADSEP, right? That's what you guys call it? ADSEP? Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, that's, that's a kind of a short, yeah. That's a military thing. You kind of shorten everything. Yeah. And yeah. ADSEP or BOI is another term for Shorten it. everything yeah. like your workouts. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, you shorten your workouts when you become a civilian. When you're in the military, you work out the full. That's kind of your job. Yeah. All right, so who wants to tell us about an administrative separation board? What is it? Why don't we start with what is it, and then we'll kind of dive into when it applies and how you guys defend them and, and what somebody can expect if they're going through it. Go ahead, Rami. Just, just for the record, because I don't think we ever got an answer to the question. Matt is from the state of Michigan. Oh, we're going to circle back to that in the next episode. And that's why Matt me. hates Cause Ohio I've got State. Because I've got the rankings right here. That's like, why I've got them. I've got them notated as well. That's why so. Matt hates. Matt's one of these people from Michigan that wakes up and goes to bed at night thinking, oh, when is, the terror, when is the terror of Ohio State going to be the over? Right there. He does. He, he, he does. Just to get he's one of, Yeah, he's one of these guys. <laughs> he watches every Buckeye game just to see if they lose. But anyway. Dude, but anyway. I went to Michigan State, which means I kind of despise Michigan, but I I truly can't wait for them to beat Ohio State this yeah, year. I, I don't think that's going to happen. Is it at the year. horseshoe as well? Is it at the it horseshoe? It hasn't happened since 2011. I think you're hoping to little brother, here, man. The next little brother. I don't think All right. that's going to happen. Administrative separation yeah, board. So Why don't you tell us... Uh, Kind of give us the overview, Robert. Yeah. So if you're the, if you're an enlisted if you're an enlisted soldier, or airman, marine, whatever, right? You're talking about an administrative separation board. If you're an officer, you're talking about a BOI or board of inquiry. And there are some subtle differences between the two. We're not going to get too much into the weeds about that. But the bottom line up front is, an administrative separation board is how the military, the different branches, can process you out for misconduct that may not rise to the level of a criminal trial or a a court-martial. So a lot of times what we'll see with admin set boards is you'll see some kind of administrative action taken before the board, like, um, you know, a GOMAR. Uh, You might see a non-judicial punishment for the same acts of misconduct. And then you know, if you're found guilty at the NJP or the you know, the commanding general files the, the GOMAR in your permanent file, typically what they do is they follow up with a separation action, which you have to get notification of, which we'll talk about, which puts you on notice that, hey, for these following reasons, we have decided to move forward with separating you from, in this case, let's just say the Army, right? Um, at which point you have a right to respond, which we'll, we'll talk at length about. But the bottom line up front is the admin set process is a way for the military to handle uh, acts of misconduct that may not rise to the level of a criminal trial. And it's it's how they basically fire you from, you know, from a, a, a brand, armed service branch. So somebody gets in trouble, for example, does what? Fails a drug test? What what are the different kind of what are the routine ones that you guys see most often? Mick, you can take that one. Sure. Yeah. I just want to uh, second that. Yeah. The military can't just fire you. Right? They can't just send you out on your way because it falls under an administrative law provision under the federal government. So Rob's absolutely right. It's how they fire you. That's I think the best way to, to, to state it is that's how they fire you out of the military. And then you got to go through this process. So typically what we see um, and what I've seen are the drug hots. You see a lot of drug hots, guys who, who test positive for THC, guys who test positive for uh, LSD, whatever it is, an illegal uh, substance, that's a good candidate for, for a separation. The next thing is sexual harassment. We see a lot of that. Yeah, especially see, the last few years, a lot of that. DUIs, a lot of DUIs. That's yeah. an easy one, right, that, yeah. they always, that they always do. Domestic violence is another yeah. one, right? And the reason for the domestic violence separations is a lot of times the accuser in those cases generally recants about what happens. That's right. So instead of taking it to a trial, it's going to be very difficult for the military to get a conviction if they're recanting their statement or they don't want to participate. They'll send it to an ADSEP hearing. And and, and that's why we see a lot of, especially the last two years in particular, we've done, uh, we have five, six, seven 
sexual assault separation boards a year for the exact reason that Mickey's talking about. What happens is, is that uh, the military is, is so hell bent right now on taking every kind of, you know, taking action on every sexual assault allegation, almost regardless of, of the strength of the case, right? And a lot of times what you see are these initial allegations of sex assault. And even if the complaining witness, the alleged victim recants or they can't find her, or in some cases we've had them come out and say, no, I was just angry at him because I caught yeah. him cheating. They will still, you know, they realize, oh, it's not a strong enough case to take to the to a court martial, but we're still gonna we're still gonna kick this service member out, uh, or at least try to. And, and one thing that I'll I'll say about um, it, it being how the military fires you, if if you know, at our firm, if we decide to fire somebody, there's really not gonna be a black mark on their record for the rest of their life, right? Uh, if you do a background check on these folks, uh, you're not going to see, oh, was fired from Capavilla Williams for showing up late to work. What makes the what makes a separation board a little different is there are serious long term consequences if you're kicked out with something other than an honorable discharge. Yeah. And even with an honorable discharge, depending on what your DD 214 says, you know, you're you can get an honorable discharge. We've had clients get honorable discharges and that DD 214 still says separated for serious misconduct. So there's a lot at stake at these boards. Well, and I think that that really summarizes your whole law practice, though, is there so much more at stake in yeah. many of the things that you do? Because you're right. If you get fired from a job, maybe somebody knows about it. Maybe there's something in an HR file. But but the people who go through these issues that that you guys defend against. Um, it really is. It has to do with benefits. It has to do with, you know, a permanent mark right. that everybody's going to see. You right. know, the world will see it. So, um, OK, well, let's talk about notice. So so somebody does something, somebody fails a drug test, gets a DUI. How, how does the, the service member get notice that this separation board action, I guess, yeah. and correct my terminology if I get it wrong, but um, how do they get notice that this is happening? And then what's the time frame? What happens from that point forward? Um, I can take the first part of that. I can let Mickey talk a little about the time frame aspect. But we get calls uh, from people on a, probably a weekly basis that um, are counseled, right? Uh, and, and that's how the military kind of lets you know that something's bad is happening to you. You're counseled. Your commander or your first sergeant or whatever uh, gives you basically a warning. Hey, we, we think you've done this. And you could be separated for it. And is that informal? Is that it, like I catch you, you know, out outside and I just say, hey, this is coming? Or is it more formal? No, than it's that? more formal. You have to, you know, the, the service member signs it and um, and is notified that they've been counseled. But what 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 I'm the reason I smile is because a lot of times service members will call up and say, hey, I'm being separated. And we'll say, well, have you been officially notified yet? And they'll say, oh, yeah, I have. I've been counseled. But that's not an official notification. Most most folks think, not most, but certainly some folks think that the, the military can kind of just arbitrarily decide you're no longer good enough and kick you out. But there is a formal notice procedure that has to be done in accordance to the service uh, the, that you belong to, their particular regulation, right? And that that includes a couple things. Note, you know, number one, you have a right to know what they're separating you for. So it, it, it looks almost like a charge on there. It's not quite as specific as a criminal charge. Um, and number two, you've got to, you've got to sign receipt of it. And then you have some decisions you can make um, about what to do when you're noticed. But the bottom line is when you're notified, um, that means that now these the timeline kicks in and you have a certain amount of time to respond with what you want to do. Do you want to board and do you want to waive it? That kind of thing. But let me just circle back to the distinction between being counseled and being noticed that you're that you're being separated that's that's a that's a big distinction and and oftentimes people confuse the two things is that what you're saying when they contact you what do you, or they're I, not I, sure exactly what phase they're at i i do just, see I, folks that confuse it i think the confusion comes when they are entitled to an attorney so they'll go down to their their the, the free lawyer right i think we talked about this before you get a free lawyer in the military or you can hire somebody like us right and when they go to the free lawyer it depends on when that guy starts working on the case they generally will not start working on the case until they've been officially noticed. Okay. So a counseling statement is nothing more than maybe your company commander, your first sergeant, or somebody like that sitting you down saying, hey, we're going to separate you, right? That's just a counseling. Actual notification is like a packet. They give you this packet full of all these documents, and within that packet is this thing called the election of rights. When you get that election of rights, you've now been officially noticed because now you're, get, you're being told what your rights are. And then you take that document down to your lawyer, your free lawyer, or your civilian lawyer, and you go over that. And then that's when the clock starts ticking for when you got to start preparing. Okay. And, and an important part of that, too, is 
when you're no when you're officially noticed, when you sign receipt, that's essentially when, for lack of a better term, your discovery right kicks in too. And you're entitled to all the evidence that the convening authority reviewed when 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 deciding whether or not to initiate separation. Um, and then you're entitled essentially to anything that could be relevant to your defense. Now the 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 discovery rights aren't as broad or as deep as in a courts martial. But you do have a right to see what the government has in their possession. And in certain cases, you can even request the government go get evidence, although they're, the government's obligation to go get evidence outside of their control is very limited in a separation board. One like a court martial, they can subpoena that evidence. So the important takeaway, and, and, and just to clarify, I mean, we're, we're, the reason we're doing this podcast is for the folks who might be facing separation so they can kind of get a general understanding. The important takeaway is you're notified. That's when your right to an attorney kicks in. That's when your right to discovery kicks in. And that's when you really need to get moving. Sounds like a very, like if I were a 19 or 20 year old uh, service member and I got, and I was going through this, it sounds like a very, very scary and intimidating process. And it is. Like you guys talked about it. You know it real well. Yeah. You've kind of lived it for the past decade. But I mean, it sounds like an incredibly scary process for somebody who, you know, like you said, everything's at stake, their career, their reputation, their and financial It's you know, mostly well-being. those junior soldiers that think the counseling is the notification, right? Because, you know, they don't they don't really know, you yeah. know, and that is it is it would be scary. Of course, it's scary. It's got to be nerve wracking. I mean, you know, it's it's your job. It's and, and being I would say being a soldier and airman marine is more than just a job. It's a lifestyle. It's, it's how you live your life. So, yeah, when you recognize that they're trying to kick you out, yeah, of, of course, that's going to be a, a pretty terrifying situation. Yeah. So, all right. So the clock starts ticking. You get your right to an, an assigned counsel if you want that, or mm-hmm. you can hire a civilian attorney like you guys. Mm-hmm. Right. We, we're going to do a, a whole podcast on the difference between those two and why you might choose to do one versus the other. But, uh, but what happens at that point? So you get your notice, you get your packet, and then... You start building your case. Uh, that's essentially what, what you do. You go down, you talk, you get legal advice. Generally, what the free lawyer will tell you is give me some character witnesses, right? Because what you have to understand is when you go to the board, you are trying to show the board members, and we'll talk about how many there are and all this other stuff, but the board members are like the judge and the jury at this thing. And you have to either refute the allegations that are made against you. And if you can't refute them, explain why it doesn't warrant separation. And generally how you explain how, why it doesn't warrant separation is to show that you are worth something to the military, that you've done a lot, that the that the crime uh, doesn't fit the punishment that they want to give you, right, essentially. So either you haven't done it or you've done it and you made a mistake, right. but... And, and this you can is, get past that mistake. Exactly. This is why it's important to to make sure you get legal counsel early on in the process, because a lot of the uh, you know what we're kind of taught as military counsel is um, let's say you're notified of an Article 15, right, mm-hmm. uh, and you go to see your military counsel. Well, there's not. I don't think they do military counsel do a good enough job of explaining the big picture to the folks that come into their their office and talk to them because. Nine times out of ten, if you're facing a field grade Article 15 or higher, the command is already thinking about separation. And usually, the advice at, at the end, you know, at these Article 15 advisements is, well, a fall on your sword. Yeah. You know, these attorneys don't have a lot of time to meet with these folks, right? There's like a Wednesday morning they got to see 15 people. They're busy, and a lot of times that's good advice. I'm not yeah, saying it's I not. Yeah, w- I, I would say that maybe eight times out of ten, that's the right advice. Yeah. It just depends on on the factual scenario. But if you know a board, like you said. A board is right around the corner. Yeah, you'd be a damn fool to take that Article Fifteen. Yeah, you cannot. You cannot. Um, you know, you cannot basically say, "Yeah, I'm guilty. I fall on my sword at the Article 15, and then think that that increases your chances of winning a board. You've got to look at the entire battlefield picture there and ask yourself, "Okay, if this soldier falls on his sword for the Article 15, what does that mean for his board? Where nine times out of ten, I'm pretty convinced about this. Nine times out of ten, if that if they're going Article 15 route, they've already made the decision it's not court war, court martial yeah. worthy, right? Uh, and when the soldier turns down the Article 15, which is a bold move, which we don't always recommend they do, but there are certainly times that, that we do, we know the command's likely going to just send it to a separation board anyway. Yeah. And this way, when you go to the set board, you don't have that guilty finding in Article 15. They're going in with a clean slate with the ability to tell their story, whereas if they're found guilty at the Article 15 or plead guilty or whatever— you know, the board's job becomes a lot easier. 
Yeah. Right. And your case becomes in a lot of times, you know, a lot of times weaker. Now, if they if you if you committed a crime and you did it and, and you don't really have much of a defense, it's best to fall on your sword. But yeah. I think that advice is given too many times. But he, well, but he, and just real quick, Matt, too. And you gain an additional argument at the board. Of if course, you, because you're demanding a trial by court martial. So what you're saying is I wanted my day in court. These guys wouldn't give it to me. And we make those arguments. That, I mean, that's I, I don't love, know how effect. I don't know how effective well, they are, but I mean, it's a good argument. I love making that argument. I love right. saying in closing, or sometimes I'll even talk about it in an opening statement. My client demanded a trial by court martial, and the command didn't give it to him because they know the evidence isn't here. Yeah. At the end of the day. Board litigation is pretty simple. I, I know the prosecutor loves to talk about the preponderance of evidence, but the bottom line is, is does the panel believe it happened or not? You're right. Or the board, that, that's right? right. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, coming from a position of strength is a good thing. So what I hear you saying in terms of making decisions on how to proceed, if you're accused of one of these things or you're facing this situation, is, is there's more than one decision to be made. And you have to be thinking about, if I make this decision here at this step, how is it going to affect me later on down the road if they decide to go further, right? I mean, it's oh, not yeah. just one easy decision. You've got to be looking at the entire picture of how this might affect your career. Oh, yeah, it's, absolutely. It's a long game strategy for sure. Yeah. Um, and that's why you need somebody with experience a lot of times to look at these cases, because if you have a brand new guy on it, they're just looking at the 50 meter target, which would be, hey, this is Article 15, not very much punishment, just take and go on. Not even thinking that around the corner, like I said earlier, there's a separation board. And those guys are going to be looking at the Article 15 and say, hey, this this burden of proof is beyond a reasonable doubt, right? That They found you guilty there, so it's pretty easy for us to find you guilty yeah. here. On the flip side, <laughs> right, if you turn down that NJP and you demand trial by court-martial, you may get what you want. Yeah. yeah. And that's a risky game, for. right? Yeah. Because court-martials, obviously, you know, are, are criminal proceedings with long-lasting repercussions more serious than a board. Yeah. All so, right. So let's yeah. circle back to the, the case – so you have time to prepare your case. That's the phase we're in. How long does that usually take before you get it in front of these folks? Well, sometimes it can take as much work as a court martial. I mean, we just had a, a separation board in the Air Force at Robbins Air Force Base. There mm -hmm. was three full days of litigation, a uh, sex assault case. And, you know, uh, we prepped that like we were prepping to go to trial. But I mean months, weeks, months of, of we were between the time of the notice and the time where you actually get your day in We were working that, board. I think it was 60 days in that case from, okay. the time of, from the time he was notified to the time we actually had the board was, was 60 days. Is that about normal? No. No, no. That's, that's Air Force. Air Force treats their ADSAT boards just like a trial. What I would mean, you say is the average time between notification and you get your— 30 days. 30 days. I'd say at most 30 okay. days. It's usually two weeks. You get notified. You get 14 days to prepare. You can ask for uh, an extension because generally that's not going to work with our calendar. Yeah. Right? So you can get an extension for probably another two weeks, but 30 days is basically what you're looking at. And that's why it's very important, and I, I tell this to all the folks who call into the office, right, and they say, I've been counseled. I think I'm facing separation. I tell them, hire a lawyer now. Get 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 going now before you're notified because what Mickey's talking about here is a big disadvantage the defense team has. If you're talking about a sexual harassment or a sexual assault or a domestic violence allegation in a, in, a, in a separation board, that means the government has had that investigation for months and months and months and months and months. The prosecutors already prepared their prosecution yeah. memo. They've probably already talked to witnesses. And then they go, defense, you have 14 days. And then you go, well, I need a continuance. And then in the Army, at least, they love to cite the regulation which says any basically any, – any unreasonable continuance because of a civilian defense counsel's calendar – you know, should not be granted. And it does put you at a little bit of a disadvantage yeah, because you have 14 days to do a, a lot of work yeah. uh, if you're going to do it right. Now, some lawyers should show up the day of the admin set board and, and they throw what they have out there. But if you're not prepared properly for these boards, you can get run over pretty quick right? Uh, because, you know, quite frankly, the government prosecutors have been working them for quite some time by that point. Well, and I would think assigned counsel struggles with that even more than you guys do. I mean, you've got a firm of attorneys that do this. You know, they have to be overwhelmed with their caseload, I would assume. So, Oh, I'll just give you an example. When I was at Fort Campbell um, many years ago, it was me and Joe Levin, I remember, he and I were the only two defense counsel in the summer of that year, and I was doing a board every week, once a week, every week for like six weeks straight, sometimes two a week, and then it went to like uh, one every other week on top of court-martial work. So, yeah, yeah you're just slammed. Yeah. You're yeah. just slammed. So uh, certainly yeah. a consideration worth making if you're facing this as to whether or not you use your assigned counsel or, yeah. or you the, go with a civilian. The reality is, is when you find out you're under investigation— 
right? Whether it's on the civilian world or the military world, you, you probably need to think about getting an attorney because, you know, uh, you could be facing something like this where they kick you out and you're going to lose your benefits. You're going to lose a lot of the things that you have earned in your career. To second Mickey's point, I remember I was stationed at Fort Benning. I was a defense attorney there and it was PCS season and we had a board scheduled, but the attorney in PCS and the office didn't handle it right. And I had to prep in 48 hours to represent this E7 who yeah. was accused of BAH fraud. Yeah. Um, and that's just kind of the nature, you know, that that's that's how usually the military handles admin set boards. When you hire a civilian firm, we take it very seriously. We have a team of folks that work the case. We build your packet. We, we interview witnesses. Yeah. We have the investigation because, quite frankly, we don't like to lose, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. And we take these things seriously. All right. So let's talk about the the hearing itself. Maybe run through those points quickly. The hearing itself, it's in front of a panel, it sounds like. What, what typically transpires? And then we'll talk about the final result, how that's made, how it's determined, and, mm -hmm. and what happens to the person accused at that point. Sure, I'll uh, tell you how what happened. So, yeah, you have a panel. It's ha they're called members, board members. You got a president, and then you have two, two other members. And it depends on whether or not you are an officer or an enlisted member to determine wh whether those three members are going to be officers or one enlisted and two officers. If you're enlisted, you're going to get the one officer, or excuse me, the, the one enlisted and two officers. If you're an officer, you're going to get at least two 05s and an 06. All senior to you. All senior, right? So if you're an 05... You're gonna have all 06s. If you're an 06, you're gonna have all all 07s. And I've been in that situation, and it's it's kind of interesting uh, how that works. So these guys sit there. They are like I said, the judge and jury. They're the ones who are gonna hear all the evidence. It's just like a trial in a lot of ways. You have an opening statement. You present evidence. You cross-examine witnesses. You direct examine witnesses. You give a closing argument, and then you uh, let them make the decision about what happened. They are there to decide three things. The first thing they, that they have to decide, and by they I mean the, the board members, did the thing happen, right? Did, are, is the thing that you're accused of, did you do it? If the answer is no, you win, right? If the answer is no, you're going home. If the answer is yes, then they go to the second question. Well, since you did this, should we kick you out? If the answer to that is no, then you're good to go. If the answer to that is yes, then they go to the third and final question, what type of uh, characterization of service should you receive? Honorable, general, or other than honorable? And each one has its own tier of benefits or loss of benefits. Obviously, the honorable is, honorable is the best, but that's basically what happens. Rob, I don't know if you want to elaborate on that at all, but that, that's kind of that's what happens at the board. And, and so does the board? Is it majority rule? How, how does the board work? How do they yeah. come to make their decision? Uh, it is majority vote. Um, they And they will tell you that, too, when you're there whether it was a split decision or not. Um, I, I've been there many times where we've won, but there was like one holdout. We say, they'll say it wasn't a unanimous decision. But it doesn't really matter um, whether it was unanimous or not. I guess that's an argument you, you can make on the appeal portion if you lose. And uh, I don't want to get too much into that uh, because our job is to try to win the board. Sure. Maybe you wanna, we want to win it. But uh, the it is majority vote, so two out of three. How, how, and how long do these typically take? You said you had a three dayer, but <laughs> well, I, I've never had an army, and this is kind of a difference in culture. Uh, I, actually, the biggest difference in culture to me in military justice is the admin set boards of the different branches, and I'll cover that real quick. But you know, the the Navy is uh, very informal uh, compared Navy and Marine Corps both compared <laughs> yeah. to the Army and the Air Force. In the Navy, the the panel I've had several Navy boards. Where the board will just go, okay, we've heard enough. You don't need to call any witnesses. We want to ask your guy questions. That has absolutely happened. And sometimes the, the Navy doesn't even have a lawyer as the uh, the recorder, right? That's Not the right. prosecutor, but the recorder, right? a legal officer. Right. The recorder is the prosecutor in the case, and the respondent is the defendant, right? Yeah. Um, they won't even have a lawyer. It'll be some, uh, you know, some paralegal. And they actually, I've seen a couple do a pretty good job, but they'll just interrupt you. The board will. They'll want to ask your guy questions. I literally had a board say to me, I was uh, defending a decorated Marine Corps uh, corpsman, a veteran. Uh, he was Navy, excuse me, a Navy corpsman who was attached to a Marine unit. And he was uh, a multiple combat veteran and done some very heroic things. And the board president, when when it came time to our case in chief, literally looked at me and said, I don't think we need to hear anything else. And that was very scary. And he ended up getting retained. But yeah, that very, could be good and yes, that could be bad. <laughs> yes. Um, so very, uh, very different in the Navy. The Army, um, the Army, I've never had, I've had one bleed into a second day. 
But the Army is is more formal than the Navy, but not by a not by a whole lot. You do have attorneys that litigate. The board legal advisor is kind of like the pseudo judge, but they don't really act like a judge. Sometimes they're not even in the room. Sometimes they're just like on standby and you the board president calls them with questions. Um, and then you have a whole different animal in the Air Force. The Air Force treats it very much like a trial. I had a BOI two years ago at the Air Force Academy that lasted eight days. Wow. Eight days. It's in the courtroom. The legal advisor sits up where the judge sits like a judge. You have to file motions. You have a much more extensive or dire process. We litigated motions in that case. Now, it was a sex assault allegation, uh, but that lasted eight days, dude. I only packed two suits. By day like five, I was like steaming my suits. There was like sweat stains on my suits. It was because you're working. You're yeah. working hard. You're victorious. Uh, yeah. And I, I it, it was like I was in the, you know, the OJ Simpson trial for eight days. Uh, thank God. 17 specs in that case. Mm -hmm. Well, 17 notices of wrongdoing, sex assault, one all 17. Uh, so the eight days was worth it. But my goodness, that was a very long week. All right. So it sounds to me like the the level of formality will vary depending on the branch and that kind of stuff. But you, you brought up something that I want to circle back to, Rob, which is is the respondent or the defendant for, for us laymen. They can get asked questions. Do they have to respond? Do they oh, have a, a Fifth one. Amendment a right? Question. What yeah. What is their role in these hearings typically and what do you advise and – they, they, they have the right to remain silent. Uh, they have the right to make a sworn statement, and they have the right to make an unsworn statement. Uh, if they make a sworn statement, it's going to be very similar to trial. They're going to raise the right hand. They're going to take an oath. They're going to do a direct examination. They're going to be subject to questions by the board. And more importantly, they're going to be subject to cross-examination from the recorder as well, uh, which is something you really got to think about when you're preparing a case, just like a trial. You know, Do we do a sworn statement? They can also do an unsworn statement, which is where they get up there. It can be Q and a uh, a Q and a session or it can be a written statement. And they're not subject to cross-examination. But the legal advisor will provide instructions to the board just you know explaining what an unsworn versus a sworn statement is. So the board is going to know if your guy does an unsworn statement, you know, he elected not to be examined by the board or by the uh, the you know the recorder. You know, you have to take that in consideration, just like when you have a criminal trial and you don't call your client to the stand. There's the instruction about the right to remain silent, which sometimes the defense lawyer, I don't want read yeah. to, to the jury. So um, those are those are the rights of, of the of the respondent. Mickey, what do you think the percentages are on that where somebody gives one versus the other sworn statement, unsworn versus just what do you what have you seen in your career? It depends on the rank. So the, the lower ranking that the soldier usually is going to determine that they're going to give either an unsworn or uh, no statement at all. Officers generally are expected to give a sworn statement, and that's because they're officers. That's kind of the unwritten rule. That's not written down anywhere. So this is like a military standard. Yeah, type. that's typically the advice, and I don't know if I necessarily agree with that. I think it depends on the facts of the case, but it doesn't look good for an officer, I don't think, if he's going to go in there or she's going to go in there give a statement, and then not let that 06 colonel ask him any questions. Uh, they don't like that. And you have to be very, you have to be able to read the room, right? You have to know these board members well enough to understand that they've got some tough questions for your guy, which is where the preparation comes in. So you can kind of understand the command perspective and then go over these types of scenarios with your client. I think um, what's interesting about boards more so than trial, is you'll get questions from these board members that are completely out of left field, man. Like you'll get, <laughs> you'll get questions. I mean, they'll be like, some, "What? What'd you eat this morning?" I mean, what? It will be, it will, it will be something. The, the case will be about like sexual harassment, and then they'll find something in the file, like, "Well, tell me about this, um, this drinking incident that you had in yeah. 2014. What was that about?" And what they're really doing is they're not really interested. I don't think in the drinking incident, they notice that there might be a behavioral issue, kind of a pattern, and they want to see whether or not this is systemic or something uh, innate to that that officer, like a uh, just a bad egg, or is this really just a mistake? And they're able to consider all that in their decision. They can consider oh, yeah. anything they want. Yeah, 100%. it goes to characterization, even if they're not, even if they haven't been notified that we're on 
were, were defending a particular allegation like that. It, it the argument from the recorder is it goes to characterization of service um, because not only remember not only is the board there to decide did they do this, they're also there to decide you know if we do separate what kind of characterization of service should you know should this uh, airman or soldier or marine yeah. have so. Yeah, I, I have come to the conclusion after after being a, a military litigator for a long time that military members in general like to maintain a very independent mindset as board members and panel members. That they like they look for the things that attorneys aren't going to talk about. It's almost like they don't fully trust the prosecutor or the defense attorney. Yeah. They, these are strong willed people. These are service members. It's not like on the civilian side where you could have anybody really sure. be. Uh, you know, a part of a jury. These are people who, if they're if they're on a board, they've had strong, they've had good careers. They're senior, at least to your client, and they come up with some things that I mean, I've seen questions that kind of would, would would blow your mind. I mean, uh, and then and then of course the best part of getting the questions right is then the hand, you know, the, the legal advisor will have, even in a, in a board, will have the, the pseudo bailiff or whatever hand you the question, the attorneys, and it'll go to the recorder first, then the respondent, and we all huddle up, right, and we're looking at the question, like, what does this mean? What do you think they're thinking about? Oh, I don't know. Is this good? Yeah. No, that's really bad. Oh, well, that's kind of, I mean, I would assume your experience serves you well in those situations, right? I, just, I, I want to talk about that real quick. A lot of times, I'll deny, I'll, I'll say object to the question, Yeah. but I'll act like, oh, that's a good question. Yeah, yeah. So, right, so they see you. Yeah, like, like, yeah oh, that's a good yeah. question. Yeah. <laughs> no, a lot, that's a lot of thought yeah. went into this, that's but we're good. not answering it. Yeah, and yeah. there's always, because of the informalities of boards, there's always some awkward moments with the, with the board members. Like this last trial I had, I ran into a board member every time I went to the restroom. Um, you know, I walked out to my vehicle at, after the uh, or on after the first day of the board, and, and you know, you're you're like you you're right next to these people, and you can't talk to them. Yeah, you know, they can't talk to you. It's 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 kind of a um, yeah, it's kind of an awkward you know experience. But board members come up with things that really make you make you scratch your head. Um, does experience help with that? Back to your question. Yeah, I, I do. I mean, I do think so. I mean, my I think our ability to judge a panel now or a board now is probably far superior. Than, one, than what it was even four, five, six years ago because we've been through so many of these um, that we kind of know, but I, I certainly wouldn't claim that we always know, and I don't even know if we know more than 50% of the time. We've yeah. had some wild cards over the years. Yeah. All right, so two two additional questions. I know we probably got to wrap, wrap up this episode, but uh, first question is who can attend? Who can attend these hearings? Can family attend to support their their loved one who's going through this, or are they closed? Generally, yes, they can. You got a lot of times. You got to get um, permission from the board members. I think they are closed hearings, but they can open them up. It depends on the service. Some too. flexibility there. Yeah. Okay. Typically, as long as you're not talking about sexual assault, then they they generally are open. Even on sexual assault ones, though, they they can open them up unless you're doing like a four twelve hearing or something like I, that. I honestly don't recall. Things have gotten so confusing during COVID. Right, that things that used to be open aren't open, and things like this. I honestly can't recall. I always thought they were open hearings, but maybe you're right. Maybe you've got a request to the board, uh, to the legal advisor, the board president, to have them open. Um, that's a good question that I haven't looked. I up just in know a while. we're gonna we're gonna do an episode on parents and right, and what right. they can do and and what Th- there they is an know. Air Force judge advocate out there that critiques our podcasts. So when he hears that we 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 oh, when he good. hears that we haven't looked up whether it's open or closed, we're gonna get like a six paragraph which we he checks which we you. Love. That's good. Yeah, no, Everybody he's a very hey, checked. He's the I'd like to have him on. Budsman. He's a very I mean, I've smart guy. I've got three daughters and a wife. They check me nonstop. But yeah, he's he's a very smart. I'm like, guy. hey man, if you think you can do it better, get out well, there. Well, we Dude, appreciate we get him. On the podcast, yeah, man. we gotta like get him as a guest. Yeah, for sure. Get him as a guest. Yeah, we're certainly not perfect. All right, and then last last thing, the end result. So what happens? They they make a decision. They inform your client of the decision. It's one of a handful of things, right? Honorable, other than honorable. And then what happens from there? So they come out, much like they do at a trial, and it happens very quickly. And, and the legal advisor will st- typically say something like, has the board come to a decision? And then it, it's really simple. It, they stand up and they have they have uh, their findings worksheet, which is a worksheet they're given that basically tells them what to say. And the board president will stand up and it's literally, I did, uh, you know, we find that the, the client did or did not commit misconduct. Then it's, you know, does it or does it not warrant separation? And it happens quick. I mean, you wait hours and hours and hours. You get the notice, they're ready. You go in there, you're nervous. You stand up like you do at a trial, and you find out in yeah. a matter of in a matter of seconds. And then it's over. You yeah. know, uh, it's adjourned. And you know, if you win, your clients uh, hugging you. And if you lose, you go in the back room and 
you know, you you console a client who had a tough day, and ultimately we've had tough days because we don't like to lose. Sure. Um, but the losing is a reality of being a litigator. I always laugh when I come across folks and you know defense lawyers who advertise. I've never lost a trial. Well, then, dude, you've never had a trial. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Because yeah. you lose. In you this haven't business. had enough cases, right? Yeah. I mean that that happens sometimes. That's a fact of life. Okay. I would I would just add one thing to what Rob is saying. It's a great day when you win, but if you're in the Navy. It ain't over at the win, right? Like it yeah. can go. Uh, yeah. A lot of times, what will happen is the prosecutors will be upset that you lost, that they lost. So they'll send it up to the Secretary of the Navy, and in some cases, they can overturn the win, right? Well, we're facing that right now. Yeah. Sean Flood, a partner at our firm, just had the most amazing mm-hmm. separation board win. And because it's up for appeal, we probably shouldn't talk too much about it. But it was an amazing win, uh, incredible. And um, yeah, they're 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 appealing it now. I don't even know if the word appeal is the right, but they're they're sending yeah. it up to the Secretary of the Marine Corps, or the Secretary of the Navy, and um, they're trying to have it overturned. They can't do that in the Army. They no. can't do it in the Air Force, but in the Navy, they can do that. Typically, though, they don't usually overturn it. Yeah, but it can happen. That might get too far into the weeds to do a separate episode on that, but it is kind of interesting. I think the one thing that I've I've kind of gotten from this session, maybe more than anything, is that there are different rules and a different process and procedure that controls a lot of these things. You know, between the branches and and the panel makeup and that. I mean, it, a lot. There's a lot of differences, and I guess the one thing I would just hope is that anybody who's accused knows has somebody working on their behalf who knows this stuff right because i mean if you don't know it you're at a serious disadvantage it would it would seem Uh, i i oftentimes think that litigation skills you know you can certainly get better but mickey and i have had this discussion this is probably a topic for another podcast but when it comes to being able to own your space own the room um talk off the cuff right respond to objections do the things that a really good trial lawyer needs to do if they're representing a service member who's been falsely accused of something these are some things that you just you can't teach and if you're going to go with an assigned counsel you better hope they have those skills mick and i were military counsel you know uh we had the skills a lot of people don't and that's just not military that's that's attorneys across this country there's very few folks who actually thrive in a litigation environment yeah. and i think when you're when you're facing serious repercussions that's something you got to ask yourself do i want a guy or a gal who can stand in there and knows what they're doing knows how to put on a case knows how to litigate a case or do i want to take my chances yeah and and i think you know that's a question that everybody's, you know, it's a cost-benefit analysis. Do I want to spend the money or do I want to hopefully get somebody who's halfway decent? The stakes are so high, though. I mean, the stakes are are so high. Well, they go up as you go up in the ranks, right? I would say the stakes are pretty high for an E3 um, who's facing that, but they are really high if you're an E9 and you've got 24 years of service in and your retirement's on the line, so absolutely. Well, guys, it was a great session. I think we covered all the most important points, but... uh, Super informative, and obviously you guys know exactly what you're doing when it comes to these things. So good episode on uh, on Ad Set Boards. Thank Thanks, you, Matt. Matt. And we're going to wrap it up. <laughs> we'll see everybody next time. Signing off, Robert Capavilla, Mickey Williams, and Matt Starosiak. Have a great day, everybody. This session is adjourned. <laughs>